Observatory. Sharing experiences and insights on matters of spirit, philosophy, and creativity with your hosts, Nelson and Cynthia. Welcome to Observatory, the podcast which aims to inspire and expand your life through exchanges with people about the philosophy and mindset driving theirs. This is episode three, and today we are joined by our guest professor, Adam Bradley. Honored to be here, Nelson. Yeah. We're in uh, Boulder, Colorado, at the Colorado University, where you are... I'm a professor of English and the director of the Laboratory for Race and Popular Culture, where we happen to be sitting right now in the rap lab in our our listening suite. Very nice. Very nice. And for for those uh, at home this episode, we're going to look at um, solitude and communication as a as kind of the theme as professor bradley is a new york times best-selling author he's he's very decorated in his field incredible writer did the memoir for common the anthology of rap uh he the ralph ellison work he's done uh he's he's done amazing work so we wanted to look at writing and creativity as as can often be collaborative but it's something you do on your own and you you're using to communicate to a lot of people so um i might let adam introduce himself as well i gave a little brief thing but like maybe just run down a bit of your work and uh, and what you do you have it right nelson i mean writing is probably one of the most solitary professions in one sense because nobody can be there pressing the keys for you Mm -hmm. no one can be there uh translating the ideas that are flowing into your mind onto that blank page, onto that blank screen. And yet one hopes eventually that your work will be public, will be a form of communication on Mm -hmm. a mass scale. And I've been fortunate to have opportunities to write on a mass scale. Not a lot of us do in academia. Often we're writing to each other and that's fine. You can Mm -hmm build important ideas through that that eventually do circulate more broadly but to be able to write a book that i can see in o'hare airport yeah yeah (laughs) and know that that someone is actually affirmatively choosing to read my words that's a very humbling experience and it puts uh, a lot of the burden on you and on that private process to to always be considering Mm. the person who's out there reading it and spending their good money and reading it on their commute right. or listening to the audiobook or whatever the case may be. For sure. So it's it's a it's very much a collaborative process writing books in that sense even though it can feel awful lonely when it's you in the page. Mm. So um we're going to dig more into that I think in a little bit. I want I'm wondering if you could just tell people how you how you got started or like how you got your interest in writing and particularly your field is um you would say african american literature history and and hip hop yes yes directly and that certainly wasn't the beginning of my path right i was a a biracial kid black and white growing up in of all places salt lake city utah which yeah. is among the the whitest places on the planet <laughs> both in terms of the snow that we get every every year uh and and in terms of the, uh, the population as well. And growing up in the 80s there, it was an isolating experience for me because I was an outsider both in terms of my race but mm-hmm. also in terms of my religion. I wasn't part of the dominant religious faith, which mm-hmm. is Mormonism. So I was, I was an outsider. And on top of that, I was taught at home until high school by wow. my grandparents. And my grandmother was a tremendous, tremendous teacher, high school teacher, high school art history and and English teacher. And she quit her job to teach me at home and taught me how to read and taught me how to write. And and, uh, that was the beginning of my path toward literary studies is reading at at, at her knee, you know, reading the romantic poets, the Victorians, Mm. uh, reading, you know, through the American canon, Evan, Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost and all of these these voices were swirling in my head at the very same time as De La Soul was yeah, swirling in my head. That's cool. And Public Enemy and the Beastie Boys and A Tribe Called Quest sure. and you know MC Light, all of these 
teeming voices colliding together. And even in my young brain at, at eight, nine, ten years old, I was already getting a feel that there was a line of continuity that connected what these poets mm -hmm. were writing about and the ways that they were writing about it hundreds of years ago For and sure. what these young contemporary black and brown mostly artists were creating through this new, relatively new medium mm. called hip hop. That's amazing. And I, I can only sort of gather that the, there maybe wasn't the biggest hip hop scene in, in Salt Lake City then. <laughs> it was about like Adelaide, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was a dedicated crew of crew. folks and, yep. and it was a, an outsider form of, of culture. And, and, you know, but and I got to say, I wasn't even a part of that so yeah. much as a kid. I, I didn't have that kind of community even mm -hmm. through hip hop. It was only by proxy that I connected to hip hop. And I mean, I'm almost embarrassed embarrassed to admit that one of my earliest introductions to hip hop was through uh, essentially, I guess, what we call now an infomercial. Yeah. And it was it was Alfonso Ribeiro of yeah. Fresh Prince of Bel Air fame, <laughs> Carlton Banks, Carlton. <laughs> and he had this uh, as a kid. He was a, 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 I guess a b boy in part, and 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 uh, he sold this. Um, kit that included a uh, cardboard break dancing space mm. included uh something that he called a rap sheet that's amazing <laughs> which was a, a poster with lyrics on it and then the most important thing were these two cassettes right and the cassettes had music that that would blow your mind from grandmaster flash and the furious five and the treacherous three and all of these old school hip-hop artists and so i got my mom to send in that check for 1995. That's awesome. <laughs> and four to six weeks later, this kit arrives and it opened me up to something that was so transformative, not just in the music. And you and I have talked about this before and we share this experience of you know, the discovery of the music and it's it somehow unearthing something that was always already within us. And for me, it was also a matter of unlocking something about my racial identity, right. about the black part of my family that For I was sure. disconnected from because I didn't grow up with my black father in the, in the picture. So it was a way for me to see myself reflected in these young black artists mm -hmm. who are creating this music and this literary form right. uh, that, that would end up taking over the world. It's amazing. And I guess, uh, talking about solitude then in some ways you had that solitude of being in in a city where hip-hop mm. wasn't prevalent and then also the homeschooling yep. I'm, I'm pretty curious about that to be honest because i haven't met a lot of people <laughs> who are homeschooled and I'm, I'm wondering what that experience was yeah. like what how it shaped you and um yeah what was it do you think it was beneficial i mean it's hard to know when you're it's your experience well, yeah what are you putting it up you against can't compare it to yeah that. but but i you know there, there's often this stigma or stereotype around homeschooling that it's only for religious zealots or right. <laughs> for shut-ins or whatever and, and for for me it was something quite different it was mm. a lifeline mm. you know because i had started out in school I, I was living in northern california with my mother who had remarried to my stepfather and uh, had my little brother and i was in uh first grade and my mother got called into parent teacher conference and the right. teacher said Adam, he's the sweetest boy in class, but he's just not that bright. Whoa. <laughs> and my mom, who's a fiery redhead, pulled me out of school, had some choice words, I imagine, for that teacher. Wow. And then ultimately made the decision a few months later to move back in with her parents in Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. Just, just me and my little brother and her. She got divorced from my, my brother's dad and and we restarted our life. Mm. Uh, and, and part of that restart was my grandmother recognizing in me this capacity mm. for language that was latent, that mm. for whatever reason in the context of that school wasn't emerging. And she said, I can teach this boy to read and mm. to write. And that's what she did with what seemed like in a matter of weeks. Wow. I was reading everything. I was reading the cereal boxes. I was reading the signs as we drove through the city. 
Uh, and, and before long, she put a pencil in my hand and gave me a pad of paper, and she said, go out and write what you see. Describe it. And so some of the first words I wrote were poetry. That's awesome. You know, driven by that. So so she was she herself was not a um, a writer or, or a poet, at least not a published one. Mm-hmm. But she had such deep appreciation for the art and such a, a profound knowledge on how to teach. And, That's great. You know, to me, that was the beginning of my journey toward this path where I'm a writer and a teacher myself. And it's a, it's a consequence directly of her and of others who would follow to mentor me and build on the lessons that she laid down she in those down. early years. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, that's an interesting thing about human potential is, is, and uh, you being an educator, you yeah. must see that everyone has potential in them. Uh, and most, to, people. Most, most people. Most <laughs> people. No, not nah, for nah. real. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess, how to uh, how to cultivate that in yeah. people and and how to um how to not limit put limitations on on someone you know and it's harder work to do that frankly than it is just to offer displays of every edition just to show your knowledge off and, right you know so sometimes when I'm feeling lazy I'm glad when I have a lecture course mm. where I can just step in front and entertain for 50 minutes for sure but when you're in a seminar and you're there for an hour and a half or three hours or whatever it is, then you have to think consciously about how others think. Mm. And you have to, instead of you know, thinking of them as repositories in which you pour ideas into their heads, yeah. uh, you have to think of ways to, to lead them to the very kinds of moments of awakening and inspiration that you yourself found for sure for you for yourself and and that that is a the great responsibility of teachers and one that the best teachers take up and that's why I model my work as a college professor often on the work that's done by people who teach in elementary school and in yeah. the early you know primary grades and secondary schools because those are the teachers that often are most passionately engaged in that process of of learning how people learn yeah exactly yeah that's really that's really profound Uh, my other host cynthia is not here but she would laugh because i'm always quoting bruce lee but like there's a great bruce lee quote where he says something about uh, you know this isn't verbatim but he 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 says that you know i'm not telling you how to live i'm I'm showing you how to be your your best self and 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 learn how to learn and that's like something from doing workshops with you and people mm-hmm. who don't know, I'm uh, here with Professor Bradley doing some uh, lectures and 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 uh, workshops. Yeah. At the university and the schools and and yeah, throwing a party or and two and throwing a party or two, <laughs> of course. But it's uh it's interesting that you do kind of sometimes I'm thinking about what the what the student is thinking and and, yeah. and not just like yeah trying to dictate something or to the kid but just like trying to get into their realization point you know like so it's yeah. it's their thing not it's not And yours. that's that's part of our journey as as educators our journey of maturation and and becoming more skilled in in our job because th- there will be a moment in in pretty much every teacher's life where they may not want to do that kind of work and for me it it came when I thought I was I'm doing all these other things, writing these books. And uh, I remember when I was working with Common, for instance, where I was teaching, I was still teaching during this, I was teaching on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but after doing my, my Thursday class, I would hop on a plane and I would head out to LA or Chicago or New York, wherever he was, and spend the weekend and come back and, and, and go directly from the airport to campus to teach before wow. going home on Tuesday. So I had the schedule where yeah, I was teaching and ostensibly I was engaged in the process of the courses and working with the students. But for real, it, it, it was hard for me to direct my energy yeah, into the yeah. course in the way that I should. And I think the classes suffered. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it won't even show up in the course evaluations or things like that. But you as, as a teacher having taught well will know when you're not teaching for sure. up to your You'll be potential. Able to identify that. You'll feel it. And I felt it in... in 
in those times. And those are the moments when you have to go back to those bedrock principles of, of what got you inspired and, and try to do the same for others. Exactly. So, so bringing it back, uh, you, you did your studies at Harvard? Well, I started before Harvard, right after being homeschooled till high school, and then I went to this big public high school in Utah where there were only uh, three and a half black kids. I was a half. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from there, moved on to a small liberal arts college in Portland, Oregon cool. called Lewis and Clark. And it was a relatively, it was about the same size as my high school, about right. 1,800, 1,900 students. And, and it, was a, it, was, it ended up being a wonderful place to incubate both my academic stuff and my, the life of my mind, but also just my life as a social being. Yeah. You know, because I, I had essentially, I mean, the first year of college was basically like, fourth or fifth grade for me <laughs> in terms of being in school with people. Right. And, and so I, I had a really steep learning curve of just forging deep friendships and, and you know, certainly romantic relationships. And I mean, all of these things were co coming at me fast. And, yeah. and I, was, I was getting into the flow of, of that life and, and balancing that while still you know, doing what I needed to do in the classroom. And, and that, that was a transformative place for me, that school, That's that cool. little school. And I still go back regularly. Nice. feel really connected to that place. And that was before Harvard. Great. And then, and so then from there you went to Harvard to complete your, your studies? I or? did master's and a doctorate there. And in, in English, uh, although at, at back at Lewis and Clark, there was a moment when I thought I'd go to law school and, right. and take that path. I had these visions of being uh, a civil rights attorney in the in the mold of Thurgood Marshall, mm -hmm. whatever that would mean for the yeah. late 20th century, early 21st century. I wanted to do that. But ultimately, I got seduced by language yeah, and literature right. and specifically the work of one author, Ralph Ellison. Wow. You know, I mean, that's explain maybe for some of the listeners who aren't as versed in yeah. maybe literature, African American history, or yeah. let them know about who Ralph Ellison is because it's one of the most incredible. Yeah, Ra Ralph Ellison is the author of only one novel published in his lifetime. And it's Invisible Man, published mm -hmm. in 1952. And Ellison became the first black man to win the National Book Award the very next year, beating out. Ernest Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. Uh, Invisible Man is this powerful story of one young man's coming of age, one young artist coming of age, writers coming mm -hmm. of age in the space of the North and the South, in the spaces of black and white uh, racial division, in the under the pressure of Jim Crow of, of racism. Mm -hmm. All of this, it's a novel ultimately that goes from that individual experience of this young black man and reaches out to the world. Mm. The book begins in an invisible man's voice where he articulates this idea. He says, I am an invisible man. Mm. By the end of the book, he writes these lines, it, and it is this which frightens me. Who knows but that on the lower frequencies, I speak for you. And that idea of speaking for you is, is such a dramatic and bold and audacious claim mm. for this young black protagonist. And for, Especially in that time. Yeah, at that moment, yeah. to stake that claim. And, and so to me, it's one of the, the most significant books about black American identity, but identity writ large in, mm. in any context. It's been translated into dozens of languages and mm. resonates as much. And Russia as it does and yeah I would recommend and, you know, everyone listening to read that it's, yeah it's, like it's, it's got to be on your bucket list and it's not an easy book to read but but the the labor in it and it's a labor that's both intellectual but also emotional mm. the labor is part of what makes the book powerful for sure your so, investment in it you so know? this book sparked your really sparked your interest and 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 desire to be involved yeah. with language oh yeah I read that in 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 the class of this remarkable teacher 
and now a dear friend by the name of John Callahan, who was also a friend of Ellison's, I came right. to find out. And when Ellison passed away in 1994 during my sophomore year of college, John Callahan was named Ellison's literary executor. And the literary executor takes care of the writer's legacy and, mm -hmm. and makes decisions on what should be published and what shouldn't, if there are works that the author had uh, had in the in 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 you know in the the back closet or the back of their their file cabinet that they hadn't chosen to publish the the executor makes those choices so it's a very important role of course and John Callahan made me his research assistant as when I was nineteen and, oh my and gosh. that that really was it and so it was it was both reading Invisible Man which I did as a freshman when I was eighteen but also reading Ellison's unfinished second novel. And this is a book he started soon after the publication mm -hmm. of Invisible Man and would write for the next 40 years of his life and never publish. Wow. And he published little excerpts of it, but never the full manuscript. And so soon after Ellison's passing, all these boxes started arriving in uh, the, the Port Lewis and Clark campus in Portland and Part of my job as a research assistant was opening these things up. And Amazing. what I found were just pages upon pages of Ellison's drafts of this second novel. And it was in reading that that I said this might be my career, this might be my life, yeah. it might be my calling more than anything For else. Sure. That I had no you choice. Had that yeah. Aha moment. For sure. And touching on that, maybe for any creators or people working on something in their yeah. life, I think that's a really powerful point that. Ralph Ellison was working on his second novel for 40 years and yeah. not completed. I mean, yeah. most of us now with our attention span <laughs> can't do something for 40 minutes. So what do you think <laughs> what do you think that says about yeah, your dedicate like what it takes mm. uh, or what it means to be invested in your art or your work regardless yeah. of uh I yeah. think now we're looking for gratification a lot yep. quicker. You know, we want to churn things out, and uh, the society has sort of made this uh, emphasis on the on the work. Uh, you know, you got to work, 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 put things yep. out. But um, what what do you think there is that that we could learn from like what Ralph Ellison did with mm. his, with writing that second novel? Well, one thing: don't take forty years to write something. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and that's there's a certain way that I think he was the victim of his own ambition. In, yep. in some sense, he he said in some private notes that his goal, and in, and actually in public interviews, that his goal with this novel was to sum up America to itself and to the world. Wow! And that is a big thing, particularly as you're writing across multiple decades. I mean, he was writing this book just after desegregation. Mm. He was writing it through all of the civil rights victories of the 60s. He was writing it through all the assassinations of the late 60s, Kennedy and King and Malcolm X and Medgar Evers. He was writing it through the 70s and all the era of protest and, and through Vietnam and and up into the, the 80s and the advent of the digital age, writing on a laptop and, and into the 90s, into the, just the doorstep of, of our own century. So he was writing it across all of these periods as America and the world are shifting, shifting. shape. Thank yeah. So much. And so his novel necessarily, the things that he was writing in the 50s and 60s and 70s, by the time he gets to the 80s and 90s, those things necessarily need to shift. Yeah, they're not. They're not really. Yeah. So, so he, he did all of, of that. Ambi sometimes ambitiousness can be can be a downfall if left unchecked. If left unchecked I, I mean, I think yeah. that that for him, and the thing is, he might not have recognized what I as a and and those now and anybody can read it now that we've published. Yeah. So uh, explain what you what went on to do with Ralph <laughs> well, Ellison. Yeah, after those 40 years of Ellison working on the book, there were 20 years, of <laughs> essentially, not, not continuous, con but uh, 20, 20 years almost between Ellison's passing and, and uh, the publication of, of the full manuscript of Ellison's second novel, which, which we titled three days before the shooting and, and the we here is, is my dear professor John Callahan and me. Mm -hmm. And that was, 
I mean, imagine the experience. Oh my uh, yeah. Me at 19, you know, trying to imagine me, however many years later, uh, sharing a book cover, not only with my dear friend and mentor, John Callahan, but also with Ralph Ellison. Wow. And so that was, that was astounding. But, and one of the things we did in that book, and this is particularly important for people who are creators of any kind, mm-hmm. we wanted to show the agon, the labor, the, mm. the struggle inherent in trying for greatness. So we include multiple drafts of episodes that he mm. was writing, false starts. Mm. We include uh, infelicities and rough patches in his prose and things that he f- soon would figure didn't work and mm. change. And we wanted to show the work as always in the process of becoming, always right. in progress, and that you know, even the things that we take as masterpieces, even Invisible Man, for that matter, uh, in Ellison's work, is is something that was always and remains in the process of becoming. Right. And, and so I think for me, as, as someone who writes books now, I take from that the the fact that uh, one can always get better through mm. through work, but also that one has to make a choice mm. of when it's time to release something into the world, and that you know, t- unburdening oneself of perfection, right? Because uh, it's, it's impossible. Uh, yeah, it can't be achieved. Unburdening oneself of that, one should shift focus onto what can be useful, right. what can move people, and get it out into the world. And in that regard, I learned as much from Kanye West. For as sure. I do from, yeah. from Ellison and to see that Kanye will put out Life of Pablo and then, Rework you know, it yeah, a yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, exactly. Go back and say, yeah, I want to shift this around and, and we can now do that. Uh, it's, it's a little harder, of course, when you're publishing books to do it. But it's a I, bit different. Yeah, but, but I had the privilege of doing that with my first book, Book of Rhymes, yeah. The Poetics of Hip Hop, to be able to go back and redo it, certain elements of it bring in artists that I, that matter to me like yeah. Kendrick Lamar and, and others who didn't like Nelson dialect, <laughs> <laughs> you know, write about these artists that I listened to, uh, that maybe I, I didn't even know about or, or who hadn't burst onto the scene yeah. when I first published the book. And that for a creator, I think is a beautiful thing to have those occasions when you have the license and the wherewithal to go back and revisit your work, to reconsider it, and to nonetheless, it's to, honest. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's very honest. And I think humans relate to honesty and, and, and in art and seeing that it's, uh, yeah, so it, some people reach near perfection, like say mm. Michael Jackson or yeah. Prince or, yeah. but, um, you know, it's probably, it's probably worthwhile that we, we keep that perfection idea out of, out of the picture when we're, yeah. when we're approaching something. Cause it's, uh, and I mean, nobody did that more than the, than the folks you just mentioned yeah. who, who maybe came closest to it. They always were struggling and, and, and recognizing that they were falling short of whatever they were chasing they were in chasing. their head and, and what was in their ear. And, and, and so in that regard, I mean, <laughs> this is something you shouldn't tell young artists who are just getting in the game that basically your that art isn't in, in once, uh, always a kind of a Sisyphus effort of pushing the boulder up and it goes down, exactly. you know, and pushing it back up uh, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's also on the other hand about perfection, you should strive for perfection. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, strive for it without thinking, I mean, think that you can get it, but uh, strive for perfection, yeah. but know that um, in some ways that is it's just an ideal and, yeah, like you're going to have to yeah. release your work at, at some point you, you know, have if, to if yeah you feel it's if you feel it's at that stage my, my grandmother would always say to me adam your reach should ex- exceed your grasp yeah right that you that's should really great. yeah your reach should exceed your grasp so i always think about that with the work that i that's do that's amazing and i love that you said the process of becoming that's that's such a nice way to yeah. a nice way to put it because then there's no f- finality you know, I think a lot of artists sometimes, a lot of people set themselves in stone or like, I'm 30, this is who I am. Yeah. Y- yep. This is it. And it's like, no, they're always becoming, always looking to to develop. 
Yeah, um, for sure. It's super important. And I guess you've touched on Callahan. I wanted to speak about mentors. Yeah. And I guess Callahan was a mentor. Ellison by by proxy, by proxy through yeah, his work for sure. was, a, was a mentor. And I know you've been a mentor. You've been a mentor for me. Uh, um, man, how, blessing, can you man. speak on the importance of mentors in, in life and, and oh, creativity? Man. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it's, it's so important because with, with every, in my own experience, it, with each of these people who've come into my life, particularly when it comes to writing, I've learned these, these lessons that have transformed my approach right. to my craft. And with my grandmother laying that foundation, and, and for her it was about revision and honing. Mm. And she'd tell me to read my stuff aloud. And, you know, whatever I wrote, read it mm. aloud. And if it doesn't come off the tongue right, then go back and rework it. And with John Callahan, it was, it was a similar, it's like a, a graduate degree version of that mm. where he showed me in the way that he worked his own prose over how to do that with mine. And, wow. and just, he, he was and remain, he remains my best editor. I still send him my books before I publish them and Amazing. he gives me line level stuff and he's old school. So he doesn't send a lot of emails. He'll mark it up on the page wow. and then we'll sit on the phone for three hours and he'll he'll say page six line eight <laughs> you know <laughs> you got something wrong with that sentence think about this yeah, and, yeah. and it's, it's great to be able to do that and and then when, when i arrived at harvard there were it was in a moment in the mid 90s where harvard had what was called the dream team of african-american scholars yeah, i mean this is something i really want to yeah. dig into because this is it huge. was uh, i mean it was it was what got me there there was uh henry lewis gates jr who was the head of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute yeah. at the time and, and was the most direct line to my own career trajectory as an English mm -hmm. major. He was an English professor, is. And then there was, uh, of course, the great Cornell West philosopher and theologian and, and uh, among many others, William Julius Wilson, the, the sociologist and just a host of people, Anthony Appiah, philosopher, just amazing, amazing group. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, the historian. So I came at, to Harvard at a moment yeah, when all this is going time. on. And then in addition to the people who were there, there was also almost every week somebody amazing coming through, right. whether it was Toni Morrison or wow. Wynton Marsalis or whatever. So it was it was an embarrassment of riches when it came to intellectual life and particularly black intellectual life at this moment in this place and these kind of juggernauts yeah, in that field. and thank god i actually appreciated it at the time because yeah. a lot of times you'll look back and you'll say oh i you know i should have i should have taken an, but i appreciate it i can look back and see, say I, yeah. I knew something big was going on and I, I tried to go to every possible thing i could whether i was in the class or not i mean i took a a class or i didn't even I wasn't even signed up for the class, but I took a class at the law school where I just basically sneaked into the lecture hall with Cornell West uh, wow. teaching this American democracy course. And it, it, it didn't fit into my schedule. I had to take Victorian literature and other things, but you know, yeah. but I went in there just because I said, I don't want to miss this. I don't want sure. this is happening now. I want to need to be here in this moment. So, so, it's so in that, in that moment, I mean, working with Cornell West, I mean, if, for some listeners, some would definitely know his stuff, but if you haven't yeah. researched him, maybe you can give a background on 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 Cornell West. I, I got introduced to him definitely through people like Chuck D, and yeah. and he's definitely one of my favorite thinkers. He's just fascinating, and, yeah. and as an orator as well, he is second to none. And mm -hmm. when yeah, when I saw that, so you were kind of mentored would you say by cornell west or how would you say your relationship was man, with him? i mean it, it, it was it was what's both he a, like man just a, give, intellectual give a, mentorship but also a, a friendship i mean right. this is i'll give you one example that'll c cement all of this i think so at harvard now you can say i'm probably in I don't know, junior high school as far as my social right, right. <laughs> life is concerned. So I'm dating all sorts of girls uh, at once, and which isn't necessarily recommended to the people out there. Uh, yeah. Getting into some That's trouble. That's a Mormon thing, right? <laughs> yeah, might be, I that, think they got yeah. something like that back in Utah. <laughs> you picked up something. <laughs> Not anymore. Nah, nah. But uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm having some, some, some girl problems and 
one girl in particular broke my heart. It's this uh, wonderful girl, girl at the School of Education. And right. so I'm, I'm in Cornell West office ostensibly talking about my plans for my dissertation. And I just kind of said, you know, he can see some, he can see something's up with me. He's okay. like, Adam, you know, brother Adam, <laughs> what's going on? You know, what what's really going on? So I tell him a few little details of it. And he says, you know, I, I got just the thing. And he gets up and goes to his bookcase. And I'm thinking, well, he's going to pull down some Kierkegaard or Heidegger or something <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. going to give me some profound understanding of my being and, and keep me out of my, my heartache. Instead, he pulls out this thick book and from behind it, pulls out a bottle of cognac. Wow. <laughs> Cornell West secret stash. That's he gets incredible. us a couple of snifters, pours us a, a drink, and it was the first time I'd ever had cognac in my life. Wow. And, and I tried, tried for it not to burn my lungs when I sifted it. it you know, but it, it, that was just a moment where he, he saw my need, my human need. Human, and, yeah, the, yeah, that relatability. Yeah, and, and he made that connection with me. And, and so, you know, he was he was not just a intellectual mentor, but a friend. And, yeah. and, and, and yeah, it was a very, very powerful period of, of time for me. And uh, he was going through quite a bit, too, because he soon left Harvard mm -hmm. for... for uh, Princeton and then and then Union Theological Ser uh, s um, Seminary and then maybe back to Princeton and then back to Harvard. I can't, it's hard to keep up with the brother. Yeah, he moves he fast, does, yeah. but but yeah, he is he's a powerful voice and certainly during the era of George W. Bush in this country, he was a a necessary voice of criticism, critique, you know, really yeah. informed critique. Always reasoned and very yeah. I mean, in this day and age, we were discussing that in the car where things seem so. Uh, just extreme or, or people take these extreme approaches to their yeah. ideals right now and that's and people are attracted by that in mm -hmm. the public but Cornel West was always someone who you know he just comes with the with the knowledge and, and delivers it always delivered it yeah so emphatically and, 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 and soulfully reason, and yeah. soulfully and that's the thing he, he'd always talk about because I ended up teaching for him as well a teaching assistant for him and and He'd always quote Otis Redding and thinking about how to teach. He said, "Try a little tenderness." <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And particularly Otis's rendition of that song you know, came mm. came to mind. One of his greatest lectures I can remember was actually doing a line by line, phrase by phrase breakdown of Otis's oh, rendition, Otis. his live rendition of that song. And and but that was his philosophy. Remains his philosophy mm. in dealing. He's at once an unstinting critic of imperialism and, and all sorts of abuses of power and, and of inequality, uh, but at its core is not criticism for criticism's sake, but rather... Or his own... Yeah, or his own self-aggrandizement, self but rather his, his unstinting belief in the importance of human connection and care mm. and and of the necessary responsibility that we have for our, each other that, exactly uh, you know and 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 that's something that resonates uh, to me and I've tried in, in my in my small ways to carry that on uh, so he's he's been a profound influence in that regard he's also a real sharp dresser yeah <laughs> yeah yeah he's always got the suit at some point but that that story you said about the cognac yeah that's really like amazing because in in a, in a lot of ways it is what you were saying there that human interaction and that mm -hmm. aspect of for me I, I see Cornel West as this like intellectual philosophical heavyweight yeah. of his field which but, he is which but, he is of yeah, course yeah. and I would be like so in, I would be excited but in, intimidated for sure. sure yeah and but then it shows that someone who is so intense and powerful in their mind and spirit also is a, is a human and, and it's, imp you would say it's important to like be a bit frivolous and, and laid mm -hmm. back at times, you know, you can't take yourself too seriously or how I, would you, do you I, think that's I, important I, I, in, in yeah. life and, and work? Sometimes you got to have a silly goose time. That's it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really cool, man. And, and from, 
So from going on there, I mean, you've you've had your mentors, you've had your your uh, experience with Ralph Ellison, and uh, you're coming out of college, and then you, I mean, for a lot of my listeners, perhaps are hip hop fans, so yeah. Obviously, you're super passionate about hip hop. Yes, and your uh, so. your involvement with lyrics, and uh, I think you know it'd be great to hear some stories about your experience with uh, different rappers you've collaborated with, and mm -hmm. particular you know for those who don't know, Adam wrote the uh, well memoir, the memoir for yeah. Common. Yeah, yeah. So collaborated with the him collaboration on that. with yeah. him. What was it like? Yeah, working I mean, with Common. You know? Shoot, I'm 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 so. And what did you learn from him? Man, yeah. I mean, I, I'm. First of all, just in general, when it comes to artists, and particularly when it comes to MCs, I have a tremendous, tremendous um, respect, but also a sense of deference uh, in relation to them, particularly as it concerns me and hip hop. Because, I mean, like like most hip hop heads, I try my hand at most all of the elements and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once Alfonso Ribeiro put me on to them. Uh, <laughs> but I soon learned that rapping would not be my thing. Right. Uh, as much as I love words, that's not how I, I, my mind puts them together. And and my DJ skills are limited, as you saw last night. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't even try to get on the dance floor or, or, or throw up any any graphs, graph work. So, you know, it, it, it came to the point where I understood that my job was to do the knowledge, as Africa Bombada once said, the intellectual component of the culture. Mm -hmm. And part of that is being a chronicler of what other artists are doing and right. trying to amplify their voice or to interrogate their art and to create an audience that is sophisticated enough to appreciate the sophistication of, of those artists' craft. Mm. And so the working with Common was intensely, well, first of all, it was just straight up intense because we produced the entire book in the span of, of nine months. Wow. So that meant tremendous amount of, you know, hundreds of hours together Sometimes it would be like you and I are just, just hanging out in his living room or whatever. But most of the time we would be doing other things mm -hmm. and I would have my tape recorder going. We would just be hanging out. Right. So we would be going to get some vegan lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we'd be, which we'll do later on. <laughs> uh, or we would be in, in the car just driving up Pacific Coast High, uh, the Pacific Coast Highway, or we'd be, shoot, one time we even got a Manny Petty <laughs> and <had> the, <laughs> the recorder going. It sounds like some, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That real era of comedy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We were doing it all, uh, doing it big. But the, the thing that was most revealing to me wasn't even so much from the conversations, which got deep. I mean, got into places that I think surprised him. Right. But actually wasn't seeing him create. That told me everything I needed to know and helped me find the voice for the book mm. is seeing him in his natural element as a creator. And often this would happen in the car as he was driving the range. I was in the passenger, front passenger seat uh, with my tape recorder mm -hmm. in my pocket. And he would put on a No ID beat because he was working on uh, wow. The Dreamer, The Believer, and No ID produced I think all of that. All of that, yeah. Yeah, so he had a no ID beat on, and he would just be spitting. I mean, he he would be, because you know, he's one of this breed of artists who doesn't write. Yeah, he doesn't write on the page. So just as Jay-Z famously So his does, rhymes and, are stored in there. Yeah, and, and Lil Wayne and Biggie and a few other artists who didn't do much on the page. Uh, Common doesn't do much on the page wow. at all. And this this actually wasn't some sort of uh, product of artistic choice. It was born of necessity. And he told me this story, and I write about it in the book, yeah. uh, of him driving from his south side, Chicago, it's when he's, before he has a deal or anything, yeah. driving from his south Chicago, Chicago home up to see these girls with a friend of his in, in, in on the north side, I think. And, and uh, 
you know, he eventually he broke up with the girl that they went to see, but his his buddy didn't, and so he would drive his buddy up there because because Common Rashid had the car, right, and he would just wait out outside, you know, you know, in the cold Chicago winter. I wouldn't do that for my mates. <laughs> <laughs> and he wouldn't have necessarily a pen or a pad or anything. So he would just start. He taught his mind how to store your yeah, writing. Store what he was pen. doing. Yeah. yeah. And and so by the time we, we connected, you know, he he's been doing this for a couple decades. Wow. And to see the virtuosity of his his composition style, to see how it is basically akin to how we do it on the page in terms of mm. crossing shit out and putting new things in exactly. and you know substituting things playing with syllables and sounds and and you know it was remarkable to hear just That's how amazing. he did it and yeah so that was that was the thing is just to to be privy to that kind of creative process and have it shit. yeah right in front of your your eyes and ears to see it happening was uh I think the most remarkable thing is the thing that helped us as collaborators mm. find the voice for the book that's amazing yeah man i mean you know going on from uh working with common and then you worked on a number of other other books and then i guess i want to dig into what what is your process for writing and do you have mm. ritual mm. uh involved with with how do you assemble your ideas what 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 drives you you talk yeah. about commons process yeah, yeah um yours is obviously different you couldn't not put it down <laughs> on the page or you wouldn't have a job but that's true that's yeah. true i mean so i have become less and less ritualistic okay. with my writing as i've gotten older and, and not so much just being older or more experienced but rather being in a different phase of life like i'm right. i'm a dad now right. i'm a, i'm a i'm a husband i'm i'm i have these kinds of constraints on my time and places where i want to put my energy and my love that means i can't be single minded for sure about my craft now in the moment i will be single minded right. about it but i have to pick and choose when those moments are you have to get the kids to school yeah it's just the basic not, stuff yeah. you know i got to make lunch we didn't have any sandwich stuff today, so I had to improvise. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I do a lot of my creativity in making those lunches, to be <laughs> exactly, honest. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, but, it, but back in grad school when I was unattached, and I mean, I was so just persnickety about things. It had to be a certain time of day. I had to have yeah. a certain kind of, I'd do some longhand stuff, so I had to have a certain kind of pen, these Pilot v, V5s. V It couldn't be a V7. Right. Had to have these particular kind of legal pads that couldn't be yellow. Yeah. I had. I actually went through a period where I, I felt like I could only write naked. You know? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was like one of these baseball players or, or, or <laughs> athletes who has some, some, some sort of like uh, uh superstition and, and my i had a really great writing day one time when i had come out the shower and it just toweled off and went to the computer <laughs> and it was so good i said damn this might be the way to do it yeah, yeah, and yeah. so for about like three months i wrote naked oh my gosh, <laughs> in my apartment hilarious. with you know so <laughs> so times have changed yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, You're wearing the clothes yeah now. you can do that at, at, at 24 but but maybe not at, at 44 uh but but now I write opportunistically, right. so that means if it, if if I'm in the car waiting for my daughters to get out of school and I have my my iPhone on me, I might find the sentence. There's always time there and put it down. Yeah, yeah. put it into the notes section of my iPhone. I mean, I wrote actually a lot of the common book in the notes section of my iPhone, wow. and then would go and and transport it into a Word document. And then from there, refine. But I would have to get that initial burst of voice and creativity mm. down on the phone before I could then pick it, pick up the thread, and really, and really, yeah, dig in. yeah, shape it when I when I got to the the computer. But yeah, so so that's how, what I do now. And and of course, every book demands different things of you, and every right. book comes at a different time of your life where where you, you have certain physical constraints or mm -hmm. active constraints in your schedule where 
you know, so for, right now I'm doing a reboot of the anthology of rap, my book from 2010, and yeah. and I'm also teaching, so I can't just give myself over entirely to that work. I have to fit it within the flow sure. of my other responsibilities, and but that's also part of the 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 joys of being a creative person is is you know, finding how you can shift shapes Where to suit will, circumstance. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So what would your advice be to, say, a young writer or, or creative or someone who's going through different projects, different stages of their life? And, um, yeah, what what would your advice be? Like, maybe particularly for writers? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Well, one is to find some sort of uh, consistency and mm -hmm. and even if that consistency is a consistent inconsistency in terms of right. you know knowing like even that if you're not getting up at 6 a.m. at the same doing time it, yeah try yeah. And write every day but yeah getting something down and and making sure that you you do that and and you listen to most great writers particularly fiction writers and you'll hear that from them that mm. that you know, some of them just, whether it's a page count that they want, a word yeah. count they want, whether it's number of hours that they want, what is, they have something that they say that they're, they're going to stick to. For sure. And this is regardless of the genre, whether you're talking about, you know, Toni Morrison or you're talking about Stephen King. Yeah. And it's the same his, kind his of dedication book on writing to is really great. It's a great book, yeah. yeah. And, and I remember reading Hemingway say, you know, I do five hours of writing for a half hour of good writing yeah so, <laughs> and that's true and and, and i think it, it, he was also the one that talked about ending like wrapping up before he, you had completely exhausted the the resource of your mm, creativity that's a great so point. you don't tap yourself out and have it kind of so you can then pick it up the next day and, and be a, excited yeah, yeah and be re-engaged i don't know whether i read that from hemingway but i've, I've heard that concept and i've really applied that the last couple of years yeah is leaving an idea when you're excited about it yeah, even yeah, though you yeah. don't you feel like maybe it's not the right thing to do that it's it's really it's transformed my work process that's amazing because it's yeah you come back with that vigor instead of yeah. feeling burnt out yeah yeah and you can you can feel that exhaustion and, and it's true in writing and in music and in in you know my mother's a painter i've seen it yeah where she can overwork a canvas and and, and where, where sometimes it's there's a benefit of stepping away at a, at a moment and coming back from a new angle or you know so so i so think discipline is yeah something you discipline think is, is something but then also to to uh channel uh otis redding by way of cornell west to try a little tenderness with yourself too yeah. and and know that there are going to be moments of of seeming failure and you know falling short and setbacks and yeah so how do you yeah, deal with those? intellectual cul-de-sacs and things sure. where you got you got to turn the whole car around and you know yeah. you got you got to do those things and 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 so the certain resilience that one has to build up and and knowing that there's something to be retained even from those moments that seem like discards. What, right, and right. I learned that from Ellison because, you know, talk about doing, you know, what is it, five or six hours of writing for 30, 30, 30 minutes of good 30 writing. minutes of good writing. I mean, for Ellison, man, he would, would write hundreds of pages to get to having, say, a clutch of maybe 20, 30 pages that... Wow that he loved and and you know with every artist and with every project there'll be a different ratio for sure but you got to prepare yourself that, that that's that those moments those seeming failures are part of the necessary growth of the art right and so that's that's been my experience and writ large in the the particularly the last couple things I've worked on right. and the last one in particular that is this kind of a, a white whale of a book. Yeah, you know? I mean, I'm privy to it. I know you <laughs> yeah. probably don't, you can't really yeah, touch on it. Yeah, I, mean, I it, think but, um, I might legally be be obligated not to talk on it, in fact, Nelson, but... But, um, the, but it's tough. I yeah, mean, like it's, I really it's tough. For you, you know? like, yeah. Not in a poor, you're not like, you're not being like poor me about it, but it's like, 
how do you come back from a, a setback creatively yeah. or something you've labored a lot on and then it doesn't yeah materialize how, how would you how would you communicate to someone listening well, shit, I got to figure that out first because yeah. I'm not quite through I it. I guess but you're in the process yeah, of becoming, I mean, right? I'm it's in the process right now. That, I mean, that's that's the trick, and particularly when it's something that you put so much of your your mind, body, and soul into. And, and I, I sacrifice a lot for mm. this, this book that I completed but will likely never see the light of day. Right. And, I mean, it, it's it's – my greatest achievement as a writer and so to know that it it will forever live in my own head uh is 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 pretty pretty tough to to move on from but nonetheless one one has to look at the process and mm. and and know that nothing is ever lost mm. and it's it's just a, a, a kind of a a longer form version of the short form things that we as writers and artists deal with all the time which yeah. is ideas that spark you you take them a certain distance and then you have to let them go yeah and so this <laughs> took it a long distance and let it go but in the process i learned a lot about myself as a writer as a as a as a human being really mm -hmm. in the way that i had to grow to encompass this amazing, amazing figure that I was writing about. Right. And the kinds of intimate connections I had to the people surrounding this person and, and the story that I was able to, to tell. I'm very proud of that work. Nice. And, and that so, pride gives me inspiration as I move forward to other projects. For sure. That I can, I can now call upon those skills and that reservoir of... Uh, work ethic you know yeah. I, I kicked myself into a gear that I didn't know I could achieve as a yeah. writer and and wrote faster and and with greater quality I think than mm -hmm. than I thought possible and in in seeing that happen that I learned a lot I learned a lot That's about great. myself so it, you know we'll, we'll not to be Pollyanna about it because it's it's also just hurts like hell oh, for sure you but, but you have but, to you accept know. that yeah but, and and acknowledge it yep and still extract the yeah extract the lessons which it seems like you definitely have and will um it's all part of uh it's all part of that experience yeah as a, as i, I could have used the paycheck though i'll say that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's something that's a whole other topic <laughs> um and that comes to that that notion of the death of the author as well mm. um that's a great it's a bit yeah. more of a roll on bath yeah, yeah, yeah the like french theorists the yes. french theorists that you can explain it probably yeah better. i mean the, the gist of it was and when he's he's expounding upon this concept gosh now shoot almost 50 years ago now the, this idea in, in part that the work of literature uh takes on a life of its own mm -hmm. after it leaves the the author and the author in, in fact becomes extinct in it and, and and Barth is responding to a history of literary criticism that had become focused on the life of the writer and, and fetishizing the author and, and his or her choices and motivations and intentions and all of this and he said throw all that intentionality out the window right. that's not what this is about we can look at the book as a text as mm -hmm. something that that exists uh, independent of its creator sure. and I, th I mean a more kind of uh, homespun version of that uh, that I love is from Philip Roth the great yeah, novelist right. and short story writer and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm garbling his his language but the the concept is there and I it's this idea he said of the writing something is like packing a suitcase for a long trip and you pack it meticulously you have everything in its place you got your socks here your your pants here your underwear here yeah, yeah. Your, your toiletries you got it all in there organized you close up the 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 suitcase and you head off to the train station and then you go in the middle of the train station you put the 
suitcase down, you walk away. Wow. <laughs> and then, you know, I, li- I like that. I like and that. And then people come, and, and eventually someone's going to open it up and rifle through its contents and make what what they can of it, of whom this this thing might belong to and what these items mean and and how they fit together and all those things and and with the work of of art there's something that to that that we as an audience we as readers and listeners and and viewers and all the kinds of things that, that we take on as an audience are participators participants mm. are co-creators I like that co-creators you know we're co-creators in the process of the art and and therefore uh, the the artists, though certainly <laughs> instrumental in the in the formation of the the work, is also beholden to that audience, and the audience must take on the responsibility of doing more than passive consumption. Right. Must engage, engage and engage in the terms that the artist sets out. Yeah. But then move on and extend and extrapolate and build build on that platform. For sure. So. I mean that that that's true, uh, obviously, in what you do, but it's true too in in the things that that I do. Even though I'm I often work in a vein that's nonfiction or or that you know purports at least to present ways of thinking about things. I fully know that people will take things from my work that I didn't maybe even know we're in there. Anticipate, yeah. yeah. I see that all the time. I see it when when I, every now and then, I shouldn't even admit this, but every now and then I'll go on Amazon or some other website and I'll buy uh, one of the books that usually we try to avoid, a used book that's that has lines and markings on it. It'll say, you know, oh. so like a, a instead of a very good or a, or a, or a new book, I'll get a, a, a used <laughs> to see. really used book right. and see what people are marking That's you know see what they're underlining and and I'm often really taken aback at, or not taken aback but fascinated by the things that that someone saw fit to to pull out of what I wrote right and it makes me reconsider it and, and it's a pretty fun experience and yeah. it's mind expanding to see that it makes art more dynamic yeah a real exchange for me, it's looking at YouTube comments like, you suck or something. <laughs> Don't go too deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I try not to read them. But, oh, yeah, it's man. like a dynamic thing. And this, uh, yeah. I think that's what makes, I mean, everyone gets engages in music or art or li- literature differently. I know mm-hmm. some people are more, might be more surface or, but for me, that's what I enjoy. I saw an interview with this singer from this band Deer Hunter and he had this Mm. cool point about, you know, it's not just like genre fetishizing. Like I've got every bit of the genre like in my collection. He's, he was talking about this single focus on artists and Mm. like this, he he really appreciates. And I think I can relate to that where I just like really get into like one artist, you know what I mean? And like, I want to know what is making this artist world work and like what what's making their brain tick and and like just that fascination with like with one person one group mm. um and i think in a way when you with your work it kind of provides these say for someone who feels that way about common it's like yeah, yeah i've got this yeah. insight into that person you know and like um yeah, like not being obsessive in a weird way, but just like no. fascinated and, and appreciative of someone's art. Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely got that with the, the common book. And the most notable way is, is that all of a sudden I saw a lot more people on social media calling him Rashid, which is his, his birth right. name, uh, rather than common, because we made a big thing in the book about you know, saying well, that Rashid is this in common is this and talking about his persona and Mm -hmm. his person and and uh we said that this book was about him as a person Mm it's about rashid not common as much Mm -hmm. and people took that up i think as a as a call to connection as a route to intimacy and and you know, it helps when you're a sex symbol, <laughs> as he is in the hip hop world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I think, and so a lot of his his women fans took to that. But I think a lot of fans in general and new fans, by virtue of the book, 
came to appreciate the way that he made himself vulnerable and accessible and human to yeah. them. And, and I was pleased and proud to be part of the process of doing that. Yeah, that's that's amazing. So, yeah, wrapping up, um, thank you for being on the show. No it's doubt, been amazing, man. man. No. Like, really, I think this is such a valuable conversation and, and something the world needs to hear and people getting engaged in, in writing or creativity um, can pull a lot from it. And, and please, if, you, if you're not familiar with some of the books that or, or, the, or the people mentioned, like, go research and definitely get into Adam's work, please. You know, it's really, really valuable and contribution to the culture. Thank you, man. And, and I mean, this is a conversation I could only have with someone I respect and trust and, and admire in the way that I admire you as an artist and no, as a friend. You, so appreciate thank everything. you, Nelson. No, yeah. Thank you. And we're going to finish. We do finish with some rapid fire questions. Let's do it. So just, I mean, let's, let's see. So one, what's one piece of advice you'd give your younger self? <laughs> I think it, it would be to be, be present, be right. in the moment more. Yeah, that's right. Because nice. I was always, and I think my ambition often had me looking steps ahead. That's a ahead. great point. Ambition and, can know. do, I feel like that ambi your ambitiousness can sometimes put you in like, what am, what am I achieving and not, yeah. not being present. Yeah, so balancing that better for nice. sure. Uh, what's the last book you read or, or reading or you would recommend? I mean, I've been in your uh, office. The book collection <laughs> is out of control. Yeah, yeah, it's overflowing at this point. You know, I'm, I'm reading a, a, a fascinating book right now that I'm reviewing for the Washington Post called Build, and okay. it's about the United States State Department's program with hip-hop bringing hip-hop diplomacy to the world. And the author articulates this vision of what he calls the person-to-person -person diplomacy okay. that's possible by virtue of the culture of hip-hop. Nice. In a way that, you know, the multilateral and bilateral negotiations of governments right. can't achieve. But when it comes down to everyday people, you know, one nation under a group yeah, yeah. as a world where we're, we're connected. We have that capacity. Yeah, to connect in, in that way. And, and so that book is, has uh, been useful for me to, to, to consider a number of things that are going on in my own life and career right now. Nice. And you know, not the least of which is uh, our ongo ongoing collaboration together with, with you know, coming from from Adelaide all the way out here yeah, to, yeah. To, to, to Boulder by way of New York City. That's awesome. Uh, what's the worst piece of advice you've been given? Oh, man. Let's see. Well, it's probably that, that first grade teacher basically saying yeah. in, in no uncertain, you know, maybe not these direct words, but basically to give up. <laughs> I just can't believe there's teachers who are yeah, saying that. Who, it's who, insane. Who does that? But yeah, I mean, and and you know, there will be t times throughout your life that people, we'll uh, that. directly or indirectly, will will say or, or or intimate that, and and you know, ultimately, you got to make that judgment, and and sometimes you you need to maybe redirect, but but you know, finding a way to preserve your energy, your momentum. And redirect it, or or push on through. Knowing mm -hmm. when to do those things is is part of the necessary judgment of you as an individual, not what other my, sure. others might claim. So probably that. Nice. Uh, what part of yourself are you working on? Part of myself right now. My abs. <laughs> I, did, I had my training session today. I put a, doing that mammoth book that I I talked about. I mean, it took years of 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 labor and. It felt it felt like I went into labor. I put on like thirty pounds. Wow. So I'm shedding it now. So you're shedding it. Shape. Yeah, that's great. yeah, yeah. So and and that's that's something particularly for writers. It's important. It's a, yeah, it's a sedentary life, and you know you usually yeah. Remember usually, Akami has his book about running. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and usually I did a really good job of balancing those things, right. but with this book because it was a challenge that I'd never faced of trying to produce in such a short period of time, mm. and I wrote basically a 600 page book and the better part of a little over summer That's <laughs> you insane, know man. and and so 
the time that I would have dedicated to the gym, I was uh, sitting on my ass in front of the laptop. And, yeah, yeah. and so part of my goal for myself moving forward is, is striking a, a, a balance because I find that when I'm healthy, I'm happier and I write better. Right. Yeah, of and course. So that's, that's ultimately what I'm seeking now. Nice. And what happens when you die? <laughs> what happens? Oh, one? man. Damn. Wow! Okay, feel, yeah. feel free to pause. I know it's. I know no, it's, no, no. That's that's a, that's a profound one. So I'm 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 ostensibly a Catholic, and I'm sure yeah. that the Vatican would have some very specific guidance <laughs> on that. <laughs> Although, particularly under under our new Pope, I feel comfortable in maybe uh, freestyling a little bit on for it. Sure, for and sure. I I do believe in maybe that something more similar to the concept of the all soul of joining joining yeah yeah in a, in a collective yeah co-creative consciousness mm. and and not having an individuated sense of self mm. a, in the afterlife but nonetheless being at home nice awesome man well uh hopefully a long time before that more books to be done <laughs> that's right yeah we're gonna keep at it man for sure thanks again for coming on and uh this has been observatory professor adam bradley yes thank you sir thank you